it really is a, a, a wonderful pleasure to get to introduce yet again my colleague and now old and me old <laughs> we've been our friends for a very very long time old old friends and very good friend the very accomplished multilingual comparative literature scholars Cristina Cibantos whose third book third Jamón and Halal Lessons in Tolerance from Rural Andalusia uh, which was published this year by Amherst College Press we have gathered here to celebrate and to learn about it has been exactly five years almost to the day did you notice that Five years to the day since I had the honor of also introducing Christina here at Books of Books on the occasion of the publication of her second book, The Afterlife of Al-Andalus, Muslim Iberia and Contemporary Arab and Hispanic Narratives, which by, uh, was published by SUNY University Press in 2017. So clearly, Christina is a very prolific scholar with a very stellar career that I'm very happy to percent now. Um, many of you know her, and I'm sorry for those of you who know because I'm going to repeat myself, but for those of you who don't know her, let me tell you a little bit about her academic background and her many accomplishments. Christina is currently a professor of uh, modern languages and literatures at the University of Miami, where she has also served as the associate chair and undergraduate studies director and many, many, many committees as well over the years uh, for our many sins. Most of us in modern languages do a lot of that. Uh, she received a BA in Spanish with a certificate in Arabic from Duke University Press in 19... Sorry, Duke University, <laughs> not the press, but the university. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm just seeing like flashing lights of cross streets, and so I'm a little bit dazed. Uh, from Duke University in 1992 and an MA in Comparative Literature from the University of California at Berkeley in 1994. And then a PhD in Comparative Literature also from Berkeley in 1992. She has conducted Arabic language study at Middlebury College's Arabic Summer Language School and the Center for Arabic Study Abroad in the American University in Cairo. Um, in fact, as I've, you've heard me say this before, if you were here for the previous uh, book presentation, Christina is impressively a trilingual of, well, actually I have a favorite Spanish writer who says she's muchilingue. She speaks a lot of languages. Um, she's a, a, at least a trilingual speaker, Spanish, English, and Arabic, both uh, Darija and, and modern standard Arabic, and an accomplished speaker of French too, I think, although we've never spoken in French because my French is non-existent, but... In my Arabic too, we have, it's not like we have spoken in Arabic, but, <laughs> but I, I'm trusting the people who know that her Arabic is excellent. Um, Christina's research interests and publications encompass 19th and 20th century Spanish, American, and Arabic literatures and cultures, migration and diaspora, post-colonial studies, Arab and Spanish American feminisms and gender studies, and translation studies. But in recent years, as demonstrated in this wonderful book uh, she's presenting today, but also in her second book, The Afterlife of Al-Andalus, she's gradually moved into the area I personally, I'm very happy about this, but it's an area that is personally very dear to her, which is the persistence and importance of Muslim culture in Southern Spain, to the point that she can now legitimately call herself a scholar of Spanish Peninsular literature. So those of us, I mean, we used to be six in the department, and now we're down to two and a half, so, we're going to reclaim Christina and call her also a scholar of peninsular literature. That way we'll make it three and a half. So in addition to Jamón and Halal and the afterlife of Al-Andalus, Christina is the author of another very successful and widely cited monograph between Argentines and Arabs, Argentine Orientalism, Arab Immigrants, and the Writing of Identity, which was published also with SUNY University Press in 2006. And she's the author of dozens of other academic works, including peer-reviewed articles, book chapters, book reviews, and encyclopedia entries, all published in some of the best journals and publications in the humanities internationally, uh, including the Oxford Handbook of Arab Novelistic Traditions, the Cambridge Companion to Modern Arab Culture, the Journal of Arabic Literature, the Journal of Middle East Women's Studies, Hispanophila, Middle Eastern Literatures, Latin American Review, um, and international, I mean a lot of them, Theater Review, Revista Iberoamericana, I can go on and on, but also the International Journal of Spanish Col of, um, uh, Cultural Studies. Besides this important body of scholarship, Cristina is an accomplished translator as well, and she translates from Arabic, not just modern standard Arabic, but also I, I believe she's working on translating from Darija, which is the Maghrebian um, uh, dialect spoken in Morocco and Algeria and other countries, uh, and which I know she continues to study. Um, to complete her ambitious project as a, translator, a translator, she received the National Endowment for the Humanities Fellowship for the transla her translation project, Orientalism and Diaspora in a Lebanese Novel. 
And she's also the recipient of many honors and awards besides this NEH fellowship, including the Fulbright, the Mellon, and numerous intramural grants from the University of Miami, uh, and which she has then used uh, properly to finish all of her three wonderful books. I have heard it say, although I wouldn't know, since I'm not at that stage yet, that I've only written one book, but Christina's written many. So I have heard it that an academic's first two books represent the works they must write in academic uh, fashion and within our parameters in order to get tenured. That would be the first book and then promoted to full professor, the second book, as has been the case with Christina. But uh, that the books written beyond those two first books tend to be more personal, more experimental, and more freeing. This is certainly the case with Hamon and Halal, a marvelously engrossing for, uh, fast read without sacrificing its academic rigor, in which the author ventures into the realm of the ethnographic and experiential. Christina's first two monographs received many well-deserved academic accolades and positive reviews. This third book, I venture to say, will, will be her most widely read one, not just because she has come into her own as a writer, She's always been an excellent writer, but I think that here there's a sort of like an ease and a warmth with the writing that is just um, really engross engrossing. Not only because of this, but because it is a book born out of love that affects the reader immediately. It is a book born out of love for the cultural roots of her father, who sadly passed away this year, making today's event even more meaningful for Christina, her family, no doubt, but also for those of us who were fortunate enough to know her charismatic and brilliant father. A book born out of a love of place, the town of Orjiva in the mythical Sierra de las Alpujarras in Granada, Spain, where Francisco Cibantos and his ancestors were born before going over and crossing to Cuba. A town to which Cristina returns almost every year to reconnect with her familia granaina or orjiveña, and where after years of watchful and joyful immersion in the daily lives of the multilingual, multi-ethnic, transnational, and religiously diverse population of Orjiva, she has been able to identify and now document a productive model of not always easy, but definitely sustainable and helpful convivencia. And I use that word in quotation marks. Convivencia is a concept that is super uh, controversial, but, and Christina does away with it. She, she deconstructs it in this book. She ditches it in favor of reformulating it into the more realistic notions of quote, accepting estrangement, building bridges, sometimes literally, because there's, there's a bridge literally built in Orjiva, and two-way tolerance. Uh, this is the title of her, the conclusion of her book. So, I can attest to the pedagogical effectiveness of this book. Not, not just, I mean, I encourage you to read it just because it's a wonderful read, but also it's very practical in the classroom because I have already, and I've already tested it. In a Spanish 302, our department's course on the cultures of Spain a behemoth of a course where we just have to teach, you know, the, the from prehistory to the present. Um, and my colleague, <laughs> Susana Ayes has done a wonderful job of reformulating that course. But we need to really, it's, there's a lot to cover, and we have to do it in an engaging and not too superficial fashion. I asked my students last spring to read sections of Cristina's book in preparation for the final debate of the semester. We structure the course sometimes uh, along debates in which uh, we, the students had to argue pro and against the measures taken in Spain to promote diversity and inclusion. <clears throat> the students repeatedly pointed to the arguments presented by Cristina in Jamón and Halal as models to follow to attain respect for religious, cultural, and identitarian differences in Spain without com compromising complexity and conflict sometimes. They were really unanimously enthusiastic about this book. They were probably one of your first readers, and they were really, really happy to have it as a, as a help with this debate. I hope you will read this book with as much joy, wonderment, and gratefulness with which my students and I have read it. As a Spaniard who tends to look more towards the center and north of the Iberian Peninsula, my father was from Asturias and my mom is from Asturias for generations, right? Jamón and Halal made me discover a gorgeous little Alpujarreño town with unprecedented practical ideas about living in a community with difference through tolerance. And one following important uh, note about this book, it has been published as an open access book. This attests to the generosity of Christina as well, sort of making her work completely available for free. Uh, and it's done via Creative Commons licensing. You can and you should purchase it if you can. It's very, very affordable. It's for an academic book, it's incredibly affordable. Um, and you should do it to support the press. But if you cannot afford to buy the book, or if you're a student, know that you can download it for free at the Press website. So without any further ado, please uh, welcome Christina Cervantes. Uh, well, 
Well, uh, thank you to Hema for that beautiful introduction, which I appreciate greatly, and to the University of Miami Center for Humanities, and of course, Books and Books, but most of all, to all of you for attending. Um, it's very heartwarming to have a full room. Um, so I wanted to start off um, saying, first of all, uh, what Hema characterized as you know, sort of the, the way that the third book uh, comes together in this particular case is very true. Um, I found it both a struggle and also very liberating to write about something that was so much more personal. Um, because in the academic field, we are sort of trained from day one to leave the personal at the door. And luckily that has changed over the last uh, decades, but still it was a new form of writing for me and trying to balance, you know, when I wanted to mention something personal or how much, and then venturing into um, field work for the first time was also a new and exciting experience. Um, so it was really a project in which the professional and the personal came together in very serendipitous ways. Um, I wanted to start by, um, well, talking a little bit about um, sort of the background to this book. And um, as Hema mentioned, my previous book was on uh, how... Um, the period of Muslim, medieval Muslim Iberia, known as Al-Andalus um, in Arabic, how that period was, uh, has been used by contemporary authors today to talk about contemporary issues. So this book, uh, Hamon and Halal, is very much an outgrowth of that. It continues with some of the same themes in the sense that it looks at the relationship with that same past, with Al-Andalus. But it pairs it with the Con new confluence of cultures that is taking place really all over Europe and all over Spain, but it particularly takes place in a very concentrated fashion in this small town, which happens to have been the town that my dad was born in. Um, so it was very interesting to see this unfold um, over the years, and I'll, I'll get back to that in a minute. Um, but what I try and do in this book is use the town as a case study um, for what um, this confluence of cultures in such a short time period that takes place over such a short time period and such a concentrated fashion can tell us about tolerance. Um, so let's see if I get this to work. There we go. Uh, a core issue in Spanish cultural history has been how to make sense of medieval Muslim Iberia's cultural legacy. So, for instance, you know, someone living in Cordoba will have this sumptuous mosque maybe around the corner from where they live, but they're Catholic and their, you know, historical tradition has taught them that that is a completely separate culture. So, how do they make sense of the presence of this stunning artifact that draws so many uh, tourists every year? How do you and and you know how does it how do they make sense of their national identity? Um, so, the history of Al Andalus was not always peaceful, and as most histories are, was not linear. But a certain kind of template has been imposed on it um, by specifically certain Spanish uh, thinkers. Primarily, the the period that was. Um, truly a time of intercultural and interfaith uh, harmony and collaboration was the period of the Caliphate of Cordoba, which lasted roughly 100 years. And it was indeed a period of you know, collaboration. There were translators between Hebrew, Arabic, and Latin. There was you know, all the cultural arts um, flourished during that period. But then in other periods, there was persecution of non-Muslims. And certainly after, when those kingdoms in, that you see in the north, uh, those Catholic king, or Christian kingdoms started to expand into the south again in the process that's known today as the Reconquista, there was then uh, persecution of Jews and Muslims. With, in 1492, the expulsion of Jews, and then subsequent to that, uh, Muslims were given the choice of either being expelled or converting to, Catholicism, to Christianity. Um, but in the early 20th century, 
a Spanish academic called Américo Castro, um, focusing primarily on this, you know, the accomplishments of this period of the Caliphate of Cordoba, presented this idea that uh, Hema mentioned in her introduction, which is la convivencia, the idea that it was, you know, that all of Al-Andalus was this period of, you know, a harmonic convergence, you know, of just tolerance and little birds singing in rainbows and <laughs> the whole nine yards. But, you know, in a way, I, I sympathize with his interest in, in, in focusing on that period because he was responding to a tradition of Spanish history that tried to um, present the Muslim and Jewish uh, elements of the, of, you know, the history of the Iberian Peninsula as a problem that needed to be jettisoned, as something that they needed to separate themselves from because it had led to the downfall of Spain. So Américo Castro, you know, pushing against that, tried to shift the view towards this idea of a period of, you know, harmony and interfaith um, collaboration. But what happened was that this term then became, basically took on a life of its own. And uh, it became a largely historical, a historical mythification um, that has led to the invocation of Al-Andalus as a model of tolerance, whether that's appropriate or not. So um, I think most of all what we can get from that, though, is that it demonstrates that many humans really do have a strong <coughs> desire to find ways to make um, diversity and harmony coexist. So although there's a lot of myth building there, the impetus behind it is something very positive that we can use. Um, I wanted to go back to the cover to talk about um, the title. So the word jamón here refers to like the cured ham or jamón serrano that is kind of a quintessential item in Spanish cuisine. But it was also used during that period of the Reconquista that I referenced as a marker of Christian identity. Because um, someone who had converted to Islam, sorry, that comes later in my talk, someone who had converted to Christianity um, and wanted to assert that they were truly Christian would publicly eat ham and drink wine or do other things that were, uh, that are uh, forbidden in Islam. On the inverse, the term halal refers to those um, rules about proper behavior, what is correct for a Muslim. It includes the dietary restrictions, like not eating pork. Um, so in that sense, it's analogous to um, kosher tradition in Judaism. But it's also broader in terms of you know, uh, different types of behaviors that are considered uh, permissible, halal, or considered forbidden, in which case they are haram. Um, so I chose this title because as I was working on this project in the different written and oral texts um, about the town and about the region of the Alpujarra, issues of food preparation and dietary restrictions kept coming up as something that people would talk about uh, as part of their daily lives or the restaurants in the town. But it also serves as a metaphor for community boundaries and the rules of acceptability that allow for tolerance. Um, and later on, someone can maybe ask me about the cover art there, because there's a little story behind that, too. Um, so tolerance has been the subject of many studies within political science, sociology, philosophy, etc. And one of the things that I find fascinating about it is that it's a very paradoxical concept. Because if you allow limitless tolerance, most likely that will severely limit tolerance. So I'll <laughs> explain what I mean by that. If a society tolerant, tolerates the intolerant, if they tolerate people who do not tolerate others, then intolerance is what will dominate. In other words, um, 
oppression, discrimination, and even violence will take over. So to maintain a peaceful, tolerant society, there has to be some form of intolerance in specific contexts, and hopefully carried out in a very civil manner. So what I try and focus on in the book is tolerance as an ongoing negotiation of boundaries between what can and cannot be accepted in a given culture. Um, Spain, due to its geography primarily, is a contact zone between what we can refer to as uh, the north and the south. And here I'm using terms that uh, have become more in vogue in the last couple decades in academic circles. Um, instead of referring to um, formerly colonized regions of the world as the third world um, or developing countries, the term the global south. Um, has been developed, uh, has been used. And uh, in contrast with that, there's the global north that uh, consists primarily of um, Europe and North America, the areas that have had seen more industrial um, development and also have more economic, social, social and economic uh, capital. And then the division of east and west, which um, we're more familiar with, but we should be very suspicious of because it kind of neatly divides the world into compartments when really there's a lot of uh, overlap between cultures. And by uh, assuming that there's an essential difference between these cultures, we impose a fixed identity on them and don't allow for change or for uh, the complexities of reality. <clears throat> Um, so, in this regard, Spain has been a contact zone between both North and South and East and West. So, uh, writers from elsewhere in Europe, primarily from France and England, have focused on Spain's you know, geographic location and its history as having been part of a Muslim empire. And in the 18th and 19th centuries, there were a lot of depictions of Spain as barbaric because this was what was attributed to Africa at the time. And they saw Spain, they were trying to present Spain as uh, an extension of Africa. And that's why there's this um, French saying at the time that uh, Africa begins at the Pyrenees, at the mountains that separate uh, France and Spain. So these ideas are obviously based on a Eurocentric hierarchy where um, the countries outside of Europe are seen as less civilized. Um, interestingly though, within Spain, there's also a hierarchy and the region of Andalusia, also in part by geography and because it was the last region to be under Muslim rule, is seen as the most backward or primitive um, within Spain, the most passionate, etc. So all of these sort of stereotypes that are invoked and that are linked to the, the, what we call Orientalism or the, the uh, essentialisms or stereotypes related to the Arab world or uh, the Middle East and South Asia as well. Um, within Andalusia, though, there's another little region that gets uh, looked down on, <laughs> which is the Alpujarra. Um, and here, although it's not, you know, geographically closer to Africa, um, it had a very specific role at the end of uh, the Reconquista because that was the last stronghold of the Muslims who were opposing uh, the Catholic monarchs when they took over uh, the Kingdom of Granada in 1492, they, uh, the last rebels left the city of Granada and were holding out in the Alpujarra. So that, that region, in addition to being very remote and mountainous, um, and for that reason sort of being isolated from the rest of Spain, has also been associated with um, these uh, Morisco rebels or um, Muslims who had converted converted to uh, Christianity, but maybe not 
uh, so uh, wholeheartedly. Um, Spanish narratives about the Alpujarra have taken that association with Moorishness and run with it. So there's a lot of legends about, you know, those last Moors uh, of the Alpujarra. And these are just a couple of, I mean, the covers themselves are very evocative. Um, so the one on, the, on your left is a novel that, you know, as you can see from the cover, it goes with the Orientalist themes of, you know, this exotic culture and, you know, sexual allure um, to present uh, these uh, Arab bandits that were said to uh, live and operate in the Alpujarra. And the one on the right is a travelogue by um, a writer who actually was from the city of Granada, but had been... Um, working as a journalist in North Africa while Spain was conducting its uh, colonial campaign there. So he came back with this interest in trying to understand through the lens of his experience in North Africa, trying to understand the Alpujarra. Um, and you know, it has a more sedate cover, but that uh, image is of the type of chimney that's traditional to the Alpujarra region. So that's another thing that, uh, is sort of paradoxical about the region in the sense that it's also considered to be sort of quintessentially Andalusian, um, you know, a place where authenticity is still to be found. Um, and that's why, for instance, Lorca went there looking for inspiration. Um, so against the backdrop of these um, romanticized uh, moors, we have by the late 20th century, a major demographic shift in the Alpujarra. Most of it centered around the town of Orjiva. So this is a little town of about six to 8,000, depending on who you decide to count. Um, but it is the epicenter of this new uh, Alpujarra. And it's a place where Hamon and Halal come together in very interesting ways. Um, and as mentioned before, I have a very deep connection to the place. You could say that my research on it started back in 1989, the first time that I went there to visit cousins uh, and pet goats. And um, it was very fascinating for me to return year after year and see how the town was changing. Little by little, I started hearing English in the plaza. And I'm like, what is going on here? Um, and then later, I was walking down a street, uh, the street that actually is the one that my father was born on, and there was a center for Sufi Muslims, so European converts to the mystical branch of Islam. And by this point, I had already started studying Arabic, so it was just like a very strange sensation of worlds colliding. And I became very curious, you know, like, what, what are these people doing here? What is going on? Um, you know, and over the years, I was working on different projects, but always kind of wondering, you know, how could I write something about what is evolving here in Ortiva? Um, and I started to focus on the fact that the Alpujarra is still known as the source of Jamón Serrano. It's one of, it's the region in Spain that is identified as being, you know, the perfect climate for Jamón Serrano, because you need a dry, cool climate to dry the ham. Um, and this is a label, the one on the left is a label from a package of ham that actually has the map showing the <laughs> Alpujarra. Um, and on the right is an ad for one of the, um, the secaderos, one of the ham drying companies. But alongside that, it has also become known as the home of Spain's largest community of European converts to Islam. <laughs> So on the left is the, um, they call it a derga because they use sort of more Turkish terminology because they're part of the Naqshbandi uh, Sufi lineage. But that's um, the ser a service um, that they were having in the derga or, or the, you know, it's a mosque space. And on the right is uh, the main halal eatery in town. Um, 
So how did this come about? How did this little town become home to so many different uh, uh, expressions of culture? The first step in this process was the depopulation of the area. Um, during the Spanish Civil War, Ortega was literally on the front line. Uh, so obviously there was a lot of loss of life and also people who fled. Um, but there, then also under the Franco dictatorship, at a certain point, uh, Franco made it uh, legal for people to leave to seek employment elsewhere. So they, um, during the 50, 1950s to 1970s, there was a large uh, exodus of labor migrants who were going to work in construction or in uh, factories in Barcelona or in uh, cities in Germany. So all of a sudden there were a lot of empty farmhouses or people who had just moved to the town but no longer wanted to farm. Um, and at this coincided with a moment when a lot of Britons and other Europeans were interested in a back to the land experience. So they started buying up properties in the area. Um, at the same time, um, this attracted a lot of hippies. <laughs> Some, I mean, so, so some of those Britons were more, you know, land-owning types. Others wanted to live in a yurt, like the one you have in the center there. Um, so there's actually now a few communes on the outskirts of the town. And, you know, as could be expected, out of this came, you know, just an expression of every type of religious group and healing modality that you can imagine. And out of that came uh, this group of uh, Sufi uh, Muslims. Uh, all of them, almost all of them uh, European converts. So if you feel a need to uh, have some sort of spiritual work done, you know where to go. Um, there is no shortage of workshops that you could attend there. Um, so my project in this book is to take Oriva as a case study. And um, oh, I'm actually skipping one, a very important group. Um, Oteva is also a part, although to a smaller scale, of a broader phenomenon in uh, Europe, which is that of North African immigration. Um, so this is similar to the immigration of Central Americans and Mexicans to the U.S. Uh, the immigration of North Africans into Europe is a political flashpoint that creates a lot of tension uh, in Spain and in the rest of Europe. In Oteva, though, it has taken place uh, in, with apparent uh, calm, and there are migrants who have relocated there from elsewhere in Europe. So basically they've chosen to seek this out, because it's not somewhere that you're just going to end up, uh, it's not like a port of entry. Um, and interestingly, there is also a center for unaccompanied minor migrants in the town, and those young men um, go to the high school, the public high school in the town. So there's, you know, Every type of uh, touchy issue on the uh, Spanish uh, political scene is finding an expression in the town. Um, so by the early 2000s, the town was known nationally and across Europe as a haven for alternative lifestyles. Um, and this meant that also new narratives, but in some cases not so new, uh, appeared about the town. So this includes English language memoirs and Spanish television shows. Um, so as I was starting to say before, what I tried to do this in this book is use um, the town as a case study to study um, both how um, Ortiva has been analyzed in these older works from the 19th century but primarily to see how this new version of the Alpujarra is dealt with in contemporary uh, memoirs as well as television shows. Because as I started digging around, I found that there have been no less than eight te national television shows that have um, focused on the town. And try and use uh, basically the town as a form of laboratory to understand the workings of uh, tolerance. One of the 
uh, well, this just to give you an idea of some of the works, these are two contemporary English language memoirs on the town. Um, one by, well, both of them are uh, by people of British origin. Um, the one on the right is a um, convert to Islam who writes about her experience living in Oriva. And on the left, he, he's one of the pioneers who came uh, in the late 1980s and started farming there uh, from London. The television shows are particularly interesting in the way that they are, interest, are, are focused on presenting a link to the Arab world in the past. So they focus on the historical links, but not the present. So this is an example of that. This is a TV show from Canal Sur, the Andalusian uh, television station. Uh, the show is called Este es mi pueblo. And this particular episode uh, dedicated to Orhiva goes around and sort of visits different people in the town and asks them about local traditions, etc. And this couple owns a bakery, and they are, you know, presenting how they make certain traditional sweets. And they tell us that they are going to prepare some morisco sweets that are very traditional to the region. At no point in the show do they mention that very similar uh, sweets are made by a Moroccan woman who markets them to the European converts to Islam. So that sort of <clears throat> current connection to the Muslim world and to North Africa is completely erased. Uh, similarly, this is more of a niche television show in the sense that it's a show that focuses on um, topics of interest to Muslims. But it really highlights, as you can see in this quote, the uh, connection to the Moorish past. So it, it references Boabdil, who was the last um, Muslim ruler of Granada, and talks about how the town uh, met, demonstrates the same multicultural splendor of the past. So very much hearkening uh, that idea of la convivencia. So this type of show, I describe it as convivencia washing, because they're basically uh, presenting the town as you know, this uh, Shangri-La of, uh, of harmony and tolerance, and ignoring actual tensions that exist uh, in the town. So some of these tensions include, for instance, the fact that the uh, Alpujarrans, who have been there for a few generations, resent the fact that the British who come in don't show much interest in learning Spanish. So there's a linguistic mm -hmm. tension. And then within the Muslim community that this show actually highlights, you know, this show focuses on the Muslim community, but it doesn't mention the North African immigrants and the fact that there are some tensions between those two groups of Muslims, because the North African immigrants, for the most part, view the Sufis as sort of a fringe group were really not quite Muslim. Um, and the Sufis, for their part, sometimes see the North Africans as not really understanding Islam. <laughs> so there's, a, there's an interesting uh, relationship there that these shows do not capture at all. Um, so because I was noticing that there was this group was completely left out of all of these um, <coughs> narratives about the town, <coughs> I, that's why I, I decided to try and sort of branch out into a more uh, fieldwork-oriented uh, uh, project, and I carried out uh, interviews uh, and you know more informal interviews to keep things uh, to keep people expressing themselves uh, more spontaneously uh, with different groups in the town, but primarily with um, the North African immigrants. And this just gives a little, a couple of tidbits of the type of stories that they would tell. For the most part, I was actually very surprised um, because people would tell me, that North African immigrants would tell me that they felt very at home there, that they felt like it was one big family. Um, so there I was, you know, I had to confront my own assumptions about what I thought I was going to find. Uh, but this um, type of comment about the clothing was very interesting to me because this man who had been living in a fairly large city on the coast of Andalusia recounted that he uh, used to go out in his you know, Moroccan attire 
in that city and people would look at him funny and actually look at him kind of with a hateful look. But in Ortiva, when he goes out with those clothes, people might even compliment it. Um, but this same person also told me that he kind of was not so keen on the, on the uh, Sufis. You know, he said they're very special people. <laughs> you know, he, so he was trying to be diplomatic, but he really doesn't view them as being true Muslims. Um, and to understand why this issue of the clothing links the two groups, I'll show you an image of how the Sufi uh, convert community dresses. So it's very common to see people like this dress, people dress like this in Otiva. Um, you know, with the, uh, the tapia cap, uh, long tunic, women with different types of hijab. And these are all uh, converts to Islam. So for the North Africans, they're coming into a situation that's very comfortable. The townspeople are already used to, because the Sufi community was there before there were many North African immigrants. The townspeople are already used to this kind of clothing, and it doesn't, you know, doesn't distract anyone, doesn't cause any alarm bells to go off. And through my conversations um, with the North Africans, it came, became obvious that although they don't really feel that they're practicing the same form of Islam, they appreciate the fact that this group has paved the way for them in the sense that it improves their quality of life because they didn't have that sense of um, being recognized as valuable members of the community in other parts of Europe in which they had lived previously. Um, so what comes out of this is a sense of ambivalence and even maybe a conflicted relationship between those two Muslim groups in the town. But it demonstrates to me that even the most vulnerable uh, members of the town can participate <coughs> in the dynamic of um, toleration that takes place there. Um, so, oh, that's what I just said, isn't it? Anyway, uh, so my assessment of those television programs is that they celebrate multicultural tolerance without digging deeper, and this limits our understanding of tolerance or our ability to create peaceful to coexistence. Um, to dig a little bit more into the concept of tolerance uh, requires us to consider how it's related to power. So there are actually some theorists who reject tolerance as a goal because they see it as an inherently hierarchical and marginalizing concept. And this might sound very strange, but when you think about how it has been used by Europeans in the process of colonization, it becomes apparent that they would present themselves as, oh, well, I'm tolerating um, these primitive practices because I'm so civilized. So it became a way to mark their own level of civilization. But ultimately, this type of situation where you have uh, someone who is the active tolerator and someone who is uh, being tolerated, even though it's clear that their uh, practices and customs are considered um, you know, unpleasant, maybe even abhorrent, um, it creates um, a, diminishing, a diminished sense of self-worth among the tolerated, because they don't feel like they're actually part of the, the community. And this can actually lead to, to violence, because people feel the need to assert uh, their identity through uh, whatever means they can find. So it's that type of uh, conception of tolerance is not sustainable because it's not going to give you a lasting uh, peace. Um, but a horizontal or inclusive tolerance is one that could be sustainable. So how can we create sustainable forms of tolerance? The first step towards that has been distinguishing between a permission-based versus respect-based tolerance. So the model that I was talking about before has been described by various scholars as permission-based. You're giving the other person permission to do something even though you don't really think they should be doing it. Um, versus the respect-based tolerance where you're demonstrating respect for what, um, for what they're doing. And to try and go beyond 
respect, which is a very broad term. Uh, certain scholars have focused on the term, concept of recognition. So recognizing the other group's humanity and their worth. Within this, you also need to think of power, because who has the power to tolerate? Um, and one of the problems that I see with earlier conceptions of toler tolerance is that it's been assumed that only one group has the power to tolerate. And this reflects a very top-down, centralized conception of power. Whereas if we move to a different uh, understanding of power, like that presented by the uh, French philosopher Michel Foucault, we can understand that we all have power in some realm or another, perhaps not uh, outside the home, but in a domestic space, and perhaps only over ourselves. But there is some level of power that we have and that we can exert. And in that sense, power circulates. Analogously, tolerate, the ability to tolerate can circulate. And I connect this to what we saw before with um, the Muslim immigrants, uh, sorry, the North African immigrants who are in fact tolerating the uh, European converts to Islam. Even though they don't share the same conception of Islam or the same, a lot of the same practices, their form of uh, worship is quite different. But they tolerate them in large part because they recognize Number one, that they make their, life, their daily life easier and give them more recognition within the community of the town. And number two, because it allows um, the, um, now I blanked out. What was number two? Um, it, yes, it allows, so they have a shared concern which is how others view Muslims. So that is the bridge between those communities. Even though their practices are so different and they don't necessarily identify with each other, they know that others see them all and lump them together as Muslims. So they have a shared goal of um, wanting to enhance the image of Islam. So in that regard, the uh, uh, North African immigrants are motivated to tolerate the, uh, the converts, and it demonstrates that even the more marginalized or less powerful and more vulnerable members of the community participate in this dynamic uh, of tolerance. Um, so I think that what I'll do right now is wrap up uh, with a little concluding statement, and then we can open to questions. So given its deep associations with Al-Andalus and a pre-modern primitiveness, the Alpujarra is simultaneously isolated and unique and a concentrated version of Andalusia and Spain as frontier zones between communities with very different positions in the global hierarchy. Narratives of the region that are fixated on the Moorish past <coughs> or that build on that past to celebrate a superficial concept of convivencia, obscure the factors that are part of the negotiation of tolerance in the area. Digging deeper and acknowledging tensions allows community members to understand how power and identity are a part of tolerating, to see that they have an active role in tolerating, it's a multi-directional process, and to reflect on the points of contact or bridges between communities and identity narratives. Thank you. So we have time for a few questions. Obviously, if anybody has to, to take off, uh, we'll understand. But uh, um, we we'll want to keep them pretty short. Uh, but uh, anyway, I'll let you have the questions. Can you put it back on the display thing? I think I somehow knocked it out. Yeah. <laughs> uh, shirt, George? Thank you very much. This is wonderful. I'm Thank dying you. to read the book. Uh, I do want to ask you about the artwork, but I have a question uh, aside from that, which is, are there other actors? Uh, I mean, there were the hippies, and I don't know if they're Sufi is Islamic people or not. There's the hippies, there's the Spaniards from the area, there's the North African migrants, there's the, uh, the people who come from the rest of Europe who uh -huh. uh, are there others? 
Uh, <laughs> well, there's like a joke that people told me in Ojiva that it was like Noah's Ark. You could find two of every species there. <laughs> okay. So that gives you an idea. I mean, there's the prime, the main groups though are the ones that you mentioned. So the okay. um, the the Pitans people who have been there either in the town or at least in the Alpujarra for generations, and then there's um, the Europeans who have come, you know, seeking an, uh, a back to the land experience, but still, you know, maintaining a similar lifestyle in the sense of, you know, they live in houses, they might own a business, um, or they're living off of, they're retired already and living off of their savings. Um, and those are primarily British. And then there's the hippie communes and people who are really living off grid. Um, and they're actually the group that experiences the most rejection. Uh, and then um, the converts to Islam, to Sufi Islam, and the North African immigrants. The reason why I ask that is that uh, one of the things that you didn't talk about is like, what are the labor conditions of like, how do people survive? Well, mm -hmm. you have the uh, retired people. Right. But then I'm, I'm thinking of something that's a different reality, which is Mar de Plastico and Almería. Mm, yeah, yeah. And there's people working in farming, greenhouses and mm -hmm. stuff. They're North African. Mm -hmm. There's the Serbian mafia and there's all these other yeah. people in the show. Right. So I'm wondering, you know, whether or not, and of course there's conflict because it's a, you know, TV narrative. So, you know, what would the TV narrative be without conflict? <laughs> But I, I asked that question because I was wondering, like, how do people survive? Right. So the town mostly is kind of like the service hub for tourism to the rest of the Alpujarra. So, for instance, people will stop. They might rent a farmhouse that's a little ways outside of the town or even in a smaller village up the mountain. But they'll come to Otiva to get all their groceries, to get their car rental, their car insurance, their... Um, you know, all of these types of services are centered there. The health center, the only health center in the Alpujarra is there, the only high school there. Um, so it's kind of like that service hub. Further up in the Alpujarra, there are some um, like agricultural uh, interests. Uh, but in, I mean, in, the, in that area, it's, you know, olives, almonds, oranges, and it's mostly people doing it por amor al arte. Like they don't get a lot of money out of it anymore. Um, so it's mostly like the, the service type. Does industry. the tourism go beyond and, selling stuff and actually being on a route? Yes, actually, that's a great question because some of the children of the uh, Muslim converts have been very enterprising, and they've catered to they've set up tourism uh, agencies that cater mm. to Muslim tourists from different parts of the world. There's one of them who learned um, <coughs> how to speak Indonesian and was bringing in these groups. Um, and so that way they, you know, they can show them all the sites that are of interest <laughs> to Muslim tourists and take them on top of that to halal restaurants, which are not easy to find throughout southern Spain, as you might imagine. So uh, they've definitely targeted that um, niche for tourism. The oh, um, the <laughs> All right. But, yeah, then we want to move to somebody else. Okay. Sediments. Sediments? Mm -hmm. Set, oh, well, Sediments yeah, it could, be, it could be, yeah, it can be layers. And culture, and a metaphor for culture. Yeah, for sure. I mean, there's a lot of things that you could say, like more, on a more literal plane, it can be like the mountains and the sky, mm -hmm. but definitely also the layers, because there's so many mm -hmm. layers of cultures, like sediments, like you said. But for me, every time I look at the cover, I remember the struggle that I had <laughs> with the editor. <laughs> Because the first version of the cover was the same lines, but all the type of tones at the very top, like white, light blue, and a medium blue. And I saw it, and I had this visceral reaction against it. And I could, you know, from the way that the editor had presented it to me, she was presenting it as a fait accompli, that's it, this is the title. And I, you know, entered this email struggle with her to try and change it, which luckily I, I won in the end, but <laughs> I was, the irony of it was not lost on me. Here I was being intolerant of this <laughs> title, that, of this, sorry, of this cover that she was trying to impose on me. So it became kind of like the last frontier where I had to like think of, you know, how can I explain to her what the limit is of what I want? And so it was an interesting exercise in tolerance in and of itself. <laughs>